Yo, this is Joseph from Tsunami. Congrats to going 100 episodes, man. You either listen to the pod or you're you-know-what. Much love, Zach. Yo, this is Chris Powerhouse. Congrats to the homie Zach and 185 Miles South on 100 episodes. Truly amazing, bro. Keep doing what you do. Hundred eighty five miles south, a hardcore punk rock podcast. Yo, dear listeners, uh, we're just cutting in at the beginning of this awesome celebratory episode of a hundred episodes of one eighty five miles south. Um, so we did a little something special to present to Zach because we're really proud to be involved with this podcast and we are proud of what this podcast represents which is an oral history of hardcore you know this is documenting hardcore history in our area and um our legend episode one came up with a great idea and I'm uh, gonna let episode one tell us uh, what what we collectively did for that. Yeah, collectively, that's that's a good word. So I, I just had this idea that maybe we should do something special. Um, I came up with a whole bunch of other ideas. It just cost too much money um, for me to pull off by myself. And I just didn't, you know, I, I was thinking that everyone else is burdened with COVID and everything else. So no, probably nobody has any extra cash to throw around. But the one thing we can do is write songs. So I thought it'd be cool just to make a, you know, like a theme song for for the pod. And in my head, you know, this is going to be this kind of silly joke. You know, we'll talk about noodles and, you know, uh, smelly throughout the whole thing. And, you know, Shout out. yeah, yeah. You know, just, just make it real light and fun. So I just kind of wrote this riff and then another part. And then I, got together with Stu and Stu and I just kind of hammered out like, okay, we'll do this this many times, you know, you know, um, uh, and then Stu and I took a video of that we sent that to Daniel cause we thought it'd be cool to get Daniel out of retirement to come sing the song with us. Um, and then Stu and I went and recorded with Armand, we our, our friend Armand at the captain's quarters and we had Armand play bass and he did some guitar and then we sent it to Roger to put an extra guitar on. Uh, and then Daniel wrote these lyrics that changed the whole concept to me because they're just outstanding. Um, and then he hooked up uh, through Roger. We hooked up with a, uh, with uh, Matt Tyler uh, up there for Daniel to, to record. Um, and he sent us the track. He called me that he actually was super so excited about it after being in the studio that night. He called me which is the first for Daniel and I. Um, <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> he, yeah. was just, he was so excited about it, you know, and I listened to it and I'm like, Oh my God, this is like this. You knocked it out of the park here. Um, and uh, we're just, you know, then we wanted to add, you know, Badge and Chris and, and Kim and everybody else that's been a regular on the pod. But again, COVID has just made all of that so difficult. So, we 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 did get the tra- a track from, from from Badge, so so he's doing part of the gangs here, um, but we we really did try to involve everybody. It just it just didn't work out this time. But you know, um, yeah, big big thanks to Roger for working really oh, hard on it. Big yeah. thanks to Matt Tyler for uh, getting me into the Discourage uh, practice space to record the vocals and. Yeah. I really had a lot of fun doing this and the reason the lyrics I wrote are, you know, didn't go that silly route. I just, the one thing I absolutely love about this podcast is that we really are, you know, Zach is really put this forward to document these things that some people may, you know, may never have talked about if, you know, except for just, at a party or talking to a friend 
like this is a document that people can come back to 20 years from now and yeah, it will absolutely. document a, a certain period of time in California hardcore and I and I I absolutely love that so that's why I wrote the lyrics like that and so today on the group text that we have when we're discussing like getting together to do these pods uh we just you know Joe sent over the lyrics who was on the song and the song for Zach just out of the blue like Zach didn't know anything was coming and uh what did you think about it Well I was I was very flattered so thank you guys um first yeah, thing man. first thing I thought was god this is a fucking good song Jesus you know like I I know what it's like to write like a a simple song that like I you know I'm kind of pulling out my ass and this doesn't sound like one of those like Joe, you outdid yourself in the songwriting. Um, I think <laughs> maybe as a tribute to the pod, like there's a little bit of a, a Yola vibe in there. I know that you've struggled with songs under two minutes before, and this one clocks at like <laughs> one, this one clocks at one thirty. So it's like, you know, it's maybe maybe there there was a little bit of uh, my vibe coming through there. So who yeah, knows? Yeah, for knows? sure, for sure. You know, <laughs> Stu, I've been trying to listen to it closely to see if you're doing do that do that do that do that for me. Uh, did you? He tried to. He tried to do it in one spot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I did. So respect, respect on on the the part, the do that to that part. Much appreciated. But I'm also a fan of do that to that do that. You know. So. Uh, I went full D beat on this song, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I I love it. So I love the shit. Um, Ben, I could hear you. Hear you back there. Love your voice too. Wish uh, Kim was Thanks. here because uh, we talked before on on one of the pods about like when Kim had her group of buddies, like they didn't let her do gangs cause she was a girl and that's fucked up. And I think like, that's like, that's been a real, like, I don't know, like a pin in my shoe, whatever the fuck you say, like since, yeah, yeah, since yeah. then. And it's like, ah, I wish she would have been on this. Cause that would have been like perfect retribution because, you know, she didn't get to sing on a sorry song and she would have gotten to sing on a rad song. Um, yeah. But yeah, it she really, like, really, really wanted to. But yeah, it no, just didn't it, work out. It's hard to find the time to get in the studio. Look, we did the whole Retaliate record like during COVID. It's a fucking struggle. Um, so it's amazing that you guys were able to pull this off. It is much appreciated. I love all you guys very much. Thanks for doing this for me, Daniel. Thanks for grabbing the the Chris thing. You know how much that matters to me. Um, and shout out to Jeremy as well on that. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. All the friends of the pod, we love you and. Uh, Let's jump into the song. We'll also post it on the website with the lyrics so you can read it. 185milesouth.com. And uh, let's kick it. What's up, everyone? This week on the pod, it's episode 100, motherfucker. What the hell? How did we get here? What have we become? My God. It started with a, a shitty laptop and a snowball mic. And actually two snowball mics that I didn't realize only one worked until six episodes in. But, uh, hey, what can you do? Anyway, so this time we're flipping around on me. This was Ito's idea, backed by all these guys on the line today. And 
I'm the one getting interviewed. So what's up? Uh, help me out. You know him. You love him. He's episode one. He's the legend. Joe Rivas. What's up, Joe? Hey. Hi. Yeah. Also. Hey. 100. Hey. No delay here. <laughs> that was my favorite. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Also, you know him. He's the man behind the kit. The man smacking the skins. It's Stu Wilson from Omega Point. What's up, Stu? Yo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Also, uh, episode six, the most well-dressed man in the history of the pod. It's Dan Sant. What's up, Dan? Oh, still playing with his mic, and uh, but we'll move on. The the dude who does his homework, so I don't have to. It's Ben Edge, aka Bedge. What's up, Ben? Jesus Christ! I thought I wasn't going to talk for another forty-five minutes, and I was in the middle of taking a piss, but. Hey, what's up? <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. So we're gonna cycle that's, through. That's, that's probably what Dan, what Dan's doing right now. Yeah, or yeah, worse. Yeah, that's cool. No, uh, I just was trying to this new fucking MacBook. I'm trying to turn the volume up, and I ended up muting everything. It's all good. Hey, you got to get good with that mute button, or people think that you're taking bong rips. Like uh, old like, man yells at Klaus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have these guys interview me by order of appearance on the pod. So, uh, you know who's first? It's episode one. It's the legend, Joe Rivas. And then uh, we'll move We'll move through. Try to do uh, about 15 minutes with each, each guy. And then we're going to do a roundtable and chat about the pod and so forth. But before we get going, I just want to really, really thank everyone for listening this long. And especially the Patreons who've helped out to keep this podcast alive. Uh, seriously, you guys really do keep the pod alive. I couldn't do it if I lost money doing it. And that's that. So, but thanks to everyone who listens, who's, uh, you know, told buddies, friends, family about it. It really, uh, it matters. And in this past year, there's been so few like light, uh, rays of sunshine with like the COVID and, you know, being separate, you know, a lot of people from their friends and their family and, you know, money's hard. Everything's hard. Um, this year sucks, but, you know, I'd like to think that this pod at least keeps me, you know, involved and, and it, it gives me a reason to reach out and talk to my friends and so forth. And uh, I hope that people listening to this get something out of it and you enjoy it. And that's that. So thank you guys for all the support. And maybe we'll do another uh, hundred of them if we sell out the second press of the Retaliate LP. Otherwise, who knows when I'm <laughs> quitting. But uh, OK, let's get it going. Joe, the floor is yours. I thought it was only the first press that we were going to get another 100. Well, no, that was it. We may have quit before episode 100. If we oh, right, yeah. right, right, right. Okay, okay. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome this week on the pod. My name is Joe Rivas. <laughs> we're inter- going to interview episode zero. <laughs> See, there's a, we need those laughs. Come on. <laughs> All right, we'll just allow Stu to laugh. Yeah, just Stu. Okay. Big bastard Leo here. <laughs> so, um, I got pod centric questions. I don't know what the other guys did. So, um, hopefully they're asking other uh, stuff. Maybe not. But, um, well, that's good. My Joe. first question for you. Well, yeah. I'm just glad it's pod related because you're the only guy on, on here that could truly embarrass me. How's that? <laughs> You're just the one that knew me when I was young enough. You know? uh, okay, okay. But yeah. Yeah, I, I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. Um, well, then I can play some music instead of yours. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stu's got the tapes on that, unfortunately, and put yeah, them out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, dude. Right. Yeah, get <laughs> so, dude. Out of print. Shit. Hey, Stu, <laughs> hit that mute button, fool. Um, By the way, Reflections Comp is out on on FTK Records. Go get it. Yeah. Uh, it, it's been on the, yeah, it's the, been on the, the intros. The, the, the 7,000th plug we've made for it, but that's okay. Yeah. It's, um, it doesn't need a third episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So my first question for you is aside of episode one, what has been your favorite episode and why? Oh man. Um, the most, well, I, I of course like the the super sevens and the best ofs and when we get to do the list and stuff because 
that's just like something that I've enjoyed my whole lifetime. I mean, the when I originally got into music, you know, and liked a bunch of butt rock when I was a kid, I used to like make like top 20 lists like, oh, here's my, you know, like I don't I can't remember what show was on the radio where they'd count down like the number one hits or whatever. I would do that shit. So that's really fun. As far as like interviewing people, um, I think that the Radinsky one is like the best one that I've done. Um, just because I was able to like weave in his baseball career to like the music stuff, which was really right. hard to do. And like the format that I'm going for in the interviews, and eventually I got to break out of this cause it's killing me is like, I'm really trying to like go chronologically to like hit everything to like kind of right. lay out like a, like a documentary esque story of the person. And, and a lot of times it's dry, but I'm just trying to like document someone, you know? But so like right. to do that format and then to approach a dude who's like career is in music and sports was like really hard. And I, I really had to do my homework for it. And I was lucky that, you know, he was a good sport about it. Um, and that I held together yeah. the timeline, yeah. but yeah, that was really, really rewarding. Yeah. I, 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 I don't think there's a problem with the way you, you've been doing it, but maybe with some people that are better known, it's maybe not a hundred percent necessary. Scott might be one of those people that's, you know, right on the cusp of, you know, um, known well enough that you could, you could do exactly what you did. And I thought it, it came out great. And, and that, that is a fantastic episode, but yeah, I, I don't think there's a problem with it. I like it. I like what you do. So, well, I appreciate that. It just it takes a lot of homework because I have to go listen to everything, and I have to like plan yeah. out the story instead of like doing like an, a couple open ended questions to fill an hour and then wrap up. Like that would be a a lot easier and probably more fun. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, that just takes some journalistic thought, I guess, and to figure out what question to ask you can ask that leads into these greater discussions. I mean, that's what you're talking about, basically, right? So, yeah. yeah. What's your favorite yeah. sandwich? Yeah. And I don't know what those are. So, what? I don't know how to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. Yeah. But um, that does lead me into the, my next question. Um, and these are all kind of all tied together in one way or another. So, what has been the most difficult or tedious part of making each pod? Now you mentioned a bit there about you know doing the research and that sort of thing, but is that is that really the the most difficult thing? And difficult and tedious are different, so they so they really kind of stand alone. Sometimes they're the same thing, though. I mean, That's confusing. Sorry. No, the the, <laughs> the hardest thing for me is just like I get a lot of anxiety about running out of material. So like mm -hmm. you know I keep a spreadsheet and try to have everything filled out, and and I worry about you know, bothering all you guys all the time about, you know, Oh, when are we going to do this? When are we going to do this? When it's like, okay, I'm trying to record this episode. That's like three weeks out. And so like people don't, you know, like I feel bad about being like making it urgent, you know, but like for me, it's like, I need to get it in the bag. So I'm not freaking out about running out of stuff, you know, but like I can understand right. how that seems ridiculous to people. Like why are you tripping dude? Like it's not airing for three weeks. You know what I mean? But it's like well, to get a bunch of people together, you know, like on the on the more fun discussion <laughs> episodes, it's four people, it's four dudes. So it's like, you know, and, and we're all freaks, right? Like we're into hardcore music. So sometimes it's like hurting cats and, you know, it's it's hard. And then also it's the same thing with the interviews, right? It's like sometimes it takes a while to track someone down and then like right. I got to prepare for it. And then like I want to get in the bag. But then I feel weird when it's like all right, dude, your interview's going to air in like five weeks, you know, like they're like, well, why were you on my ass? You know, like, or I, I would just worry about them thinking that, you know, but, yeah. uh, but so that's the biggest challenge I think is just, you know, my own, uh, neurosis and, uh, and also Daniel's audio quality, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> when he gets his fancy new headphones working, it'll be all good. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was going to say that, that, you know, I, I think the, at least the four of us on the pod tonight, including your, the five of us, including you, but, and add, you know, Posse Chris and, and Kim and, and even Bobby and the other, um, 
semi-regulars that we've had. I, I don't think any of us have a problem doing these, you know, uh, well ahead of time. And, and, and I never feel bothered, you know, and I would imagine the other guys don't, and girl don't either. So, yeah, you know, it's I, just, you know, it can, I wouldn't worry about that. I know, but it, it can. Yeah. Okay. I feel you. It, but it can just be an ask, like when it's like, all right, you know, like we're going to, we're going to come up with the seven best New York hardcore songs of all time. No pressure. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, right. <laughs> you never know. Like, is is that going to take someone like a day to do, or is it going to take, like, does someone want a month to figure it out? You know what I mean? Or like, or with like the side A and side B it's like, here, listen to these 10 records. Like, I don't know how busy someone is. Like, you know, maybe they, maybe it takes them four hours. Maybe it takes them four weeks. Like, so it's just more right, so like right. the balance of me being understanding that everyone's life is different, you know, and not, not yeah. wanting to assume yeah. anything. So like, you know, someone like me, if they have a lot of free time, right? Like I live alone with my cat. Like I can, I can listen to 10 albums, you know, in a day, you know what I mean? But someone right. that like, you know, has more like life responsibility might not be able to do so. Yeah. Well, I always ask for like at least a week, you know, when you give us the playlist, you know, it, it, because I do have a lot of, you know, with school and everything else I got going on and work and all that. So, yeah. But um, I think all of us want to do the best job possible that we can. And we want to take the time to listen to all of the, all of the stuff that we're supposed to listen to. Um, so we give the best opinion possible. You know, that's why I make notes. I know the other guys do the, do the same. So this is rewarding to us. So this is like a, you know, especially in COVID times, like this is the only time I get to hang out with people, you know? Yeah. I feel you. So, you know, so which you, you, you kind of mentioned yourself. So and now that leads me into my next question is what has been the most rewarding part of the pod and talk a little bit about the Patreon piece of that. Um, or at least what, what they mean, you know, what, what that means to you okay, specifically, well, not just for the pod, but, but, but for, for, for our scene overall, how, how that ties into that. That's, that's what I'm trying to. All right. Well, if I forget, remind me about the second part a second, but I'll tell you the yeah, most, yeah, the yeah. most rewarding part of the pod. The most rewarding part of the pod has been interviewing people and whether I know them or I don't know them. Um, after their like episode airs, they always hit me up and they say, all these people came out of the woodwork and hit me up. Like I re I reconnected with a bunch of old friends and that's yeah. fucking amazing. You know what I mean? So especially for people I don't know, you know, it's like I reach out with them. I'm an acquaintance with them at that point. We do an interview and then, you know, I, I chat a little bit with them afterwards, but then it's like when the episode airs and, you know, people reach out to him and they tell him, Oh, it was so good to hear from you again. Like, and they reconnect with a bunch of old friends. It's like, I don't know. I, I almost feel like a, like a matchmaker or something. You know what I mean? Like, right. Like yeah, I, just yeah. hooked, I hooked <laughs> someone up. They got married because like, you know, uh, look, life is fucking weird and not everyone knows what's going on with anyone really. You know what I mean? So it's yeah. like for people to come out of the woodwork and reach out to people like that's important, you know? And it might be important for that person like reaching out. Like they remember, like I remember like hanging out with that guy and I remember how he talked and I remember how he is. Like, I got to get a hold of that guy. Like that's one of my like friends or that guy was important to me. And like the fact that it like rekindles feelings, you know, inside people that they want to reconnect with other people, you know, in this, this crazy genre of music, you know, that we know and love, like that's really, really endearing. Now in regards to the Patreon question, um, it feels good anytime that people support what you do. Right. And like, unfortunately, you know, the society we live in is like, you know, you, you support with your money, right? Like that's a way, you know, if, if someone's a piece of shit, you boycott them. Right. Like right. that's the easiest thing. Like, all right, the owner of that business is a piece of shit. So you don't go there, you know? Right. And then on the opposite end of that is like, you know, when people do positive things, like, you know, this is like COVID year has been tough financially this year um, for me. And like, but I'm still like, I try to go to like some of the restaurants that I enjoy, you know, and get takeout because I know it's rough for them. 
You know what I mean? So like when I'm trying to like hunker down and, and save money and eat in more, I think like, fuck, I got to go and I got to go get food at Sips because, you know, I need to support Sips, you know, the vegan Chinese spot that I've been going to for 20 years. You know what I mean? Cause right. they got hard times too. You know, I'm supporting with my money, you know, even though it'd be good easier to too. skip it right now. Yeah, it's good. And, and it's the same way, you know, it's like, I appreciate it, you know, from the, there's some people that help out and I, you know, the people that are throwing down 20 bucks, like Jesus Christ, thank you. You know what I mean? That's, that's like, I don't know what to say. Um, that's like a serious, that's serious support that like, I don't know. It's like, I'll fucking wash your car, you know, just bring it on through. Right. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like the people that toss down a dollar, it's like the same thing. It's like, you know, you're just, you're, you're supporting, you're saying like, what's up? I support, I go above and beyond, you know, like, I don't know. It holds it together. I appreciate it. Um, yeah. And I hope that like people know that because, you know, now the, the fixed cost of the pod with all like the services I have to pay for and shit, they're probably around like a hundred bucks, something like that, you know, cause like, yeah, yeah, yeah. A hundred bucks a month, maybe a little more. Um, but in the beginning when I was traveling everywhere, I was losing a shit ton of money because like to go up to Ventura for the weekend and like, you know, Ventura and Oxnard and have a place to set up, you know, where I could like set up the board, set up all the microphones, you know, and, and so forth. It was like, you know, I was spending like 400 bucks a month, you know? Yeah. And it was very hard. And then like, you know, my equipment, I dropped probably, you know, a grand into equipment or something. So, you know, the beginning was hard. The startup's hard, but, uh, you know, a lot of the people, they got me through it. And so, you know, the pod, like, I'm not blowing smoke up anyone's ass when I say, like, it's the reason it's here. Like, it's literally the reason why it's here. <laughs> you know, like, no one can afford yeah. to lose money months after months after months. Yeah. It's like, you know, us, uh, what, what do you want to call us? You know, the the, the regulars of, of our scene, and I don't just mean us on the pod, but like, you know, people of our, you know, people in bands and people that have been going to shows forever and everything, still paying to get into shows and not expecting the pro deal, you know, to, to get in for free. I, I feel that's kind of what a Patreon is. Is that is that guy or girl, you know, paying, paying forward, you know, not just expecting the free ride to get in, you know, for even, even a buck, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, that, like... that's the way I, I kind of look at it, you know. Yeah, I, I feel that way too. I mean, I've made a real concerned effort in my, you know, 30s and then now I'm 40 to like always pay the door, you know, because I have the means. And like, I remember. Buy a ticket, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, you know, it's like, let the guest list go to like, you know, the kids that might not have as much money. Jesus, you know? Right. So that's all. Yeah. Um, That leads me into the next question. What plans do you have for the pod? going forward, you know, past, you know, episode 101 and on, you know, episode 500 in 2025 when we get there. Well, it's, it's basically just a vehicle to sell retaliate records. So given, <laughs> given the fact that we don't have to make another one for nine more years now, uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what I'm going to do with the pod. <laughs> no, I don't know. I mean, there's a bunch of people I want to get, um, you know, I'm trying to document mostly, you know, California now, but I, I'll break out to the West coast. I really want to do Jerry a because like the two interviews that Jerry a did with uh, Damien from turned out a punk are like two of the best yeah. punk interviews I've ever heard in my life. And so I really want him to be on here and then I'll open it up. But I, I just, I really want to document the stuff here because I feel like a lot of times uh, the West coast is underrepresented in uh hardcore music. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So yeah, oh, I like that. I I do like that answer. That you're not giving up. So that makes that that makes me real happy. Okay, I got one last question for you. All right. Okay. How good is the new Retaliate record, dude? It is the best. Almost as good as Powerhouse, Funeral Oration, The Vows, <laughs> and every other band that we hype <laughs> on here. But uh, yeah, yeah, pretty fucking good. Uh, I'm very, very, well, well very I've heard it and I think it's amazing. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. And everyone can hear it is streaming on uh, Spotify now, you know, um, I think when this episode's out, but, uh, yeah, man. Okay. Let's open it up. That's, uh, 
20 minute mark, but I think that we did a five minute intro. So, uh, Daniel, if you're there, we can shoot it off to you. Do you feel well represented from your interview with Joe? <laughs> uh, I'm, I feel yes. Like, I, yes. <laughs> I, I feel like I'm, I'm dipping my toes in the water and I'm just, you know, it's like, it's a weird thing, you know, in 2020, like, I think everyone tiptoes around the, the like, am I going to say fucking something stupid on, on the air and get canceled? You know, I've like worried about that the whole time or, you know, or just like, you know, I get things wrong on the pod all the time. You know what I mean? Like, uh, even one time we were talking about like, uh, Matt Henderson and I was like, oh yeah, it's like old band blind justice. And like, when I listen to him, I'm like, God damn it, blind approach, you know? And like, but I'm not going to go edit it, but it's like, I just, I'm very surprised that I haven't been hit up with like an onslaught of emails, like calling me a dumbass. So, uh, I'm, well, it's because Ben's on the pod more often than not, or he would be. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it basically like paid off Bedge with like, uh, airtime. So he wouldn't punish yeah. me with, uh, the post episode emails. <laughs> hey, I just want you to know I'm a Patreon. <laughs> I, know, me too. I know. I know and love all you guys. So. And Bedge, I, I want you to know I bought your book, and I, I think I've bought all your band's records. So, what's up? Even much Ste- appreciated. Even Steven, motherfucker. All right, I'm meeting myself again. Yeah. All right, Daniel, let's do this. So, the one thing I, I personally feel about the pod, and I, is that it is like a cultural document, you know, like an anthropology anthropological document of going back and speaking to older, you know, members of the scene and newer uh, members at the same time. And um, where do you feel like this podcast fits within a, um, how things are documented about punk and hardcore and b within the glut of hardcore related podcasts that are going on right now? Um, I don't know how to answer the second one. Um, no, it, it, no okay. honestly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So here's how I feel about this podcast and how it documents things. I think that the interviews do a really good job of like laying out the groundwork for someone to later put things together in like a more historical context. My goal is to simply get primary sources down on tape, telling their story, how they want it to be told. You know, it's not my job to like interject and be like, well, wait a minute, actually you got the dates wrong or, you know, you got this wrong or whatever. And I'm trying to just like lay things out chronologically because I think that like sometimes when people write books and I guess this would be a question for, for Ben and actually Ben, if you're listening maybe you can unmute and we can just open this quickly up to you. Um, when people are writing books, you know, they have to like gather all this information, you know, from interviews, like kind of on a crunch, you know, like you're not, it's not like you're working for a newspaper where you need to get something out like the next day, but you do have like, you know, a life timeline. You don't want to take 20 years to write a book, you know? So like you are able to like gather previous stuff, I guess, but you are trying to track down people to do an interview. And then it's like, what do they remember that day? Et cetera, et cetera. And it's like, I, I just think that like getting the primary sources down with interviewing people, like someone could reference my interviews and use them like in a book and like tie together. Agreed, the story. Like, I don't, I don't think I, that, go ahead. Well, what I think is it, we're in a different era where this is just an equally valid source of information as a book these days. Do you know what I mean? This is, this is like, for lack of a better uh, analogy, this is like the way Native Americans or indigenous people, sorry, I don't want to be canceled, indigenous people of America would tell their history from one person to another, you know, in an oral tradition. And I think there's something that I think breathe so much life into it by it being a conversation instead of it being an interview that is being documented for lines. Do you know what I mean? Well, I, it's, it's I, why I like to do the combination of both, right? The, the dry and then also the discussion. 
because like the interviews, like I said, they're just getting out primary sources to have people tell their stories. They, you would need like, because you can interview, like for instance, I've interviewed the four original members of ill repute and all their stories are pretty similar, but also like diverge a bit. And if you were going to tell the story of ill repute, you know, you couldn't just have one of those. You would need someone to like take those all and then put it into context. So like for that part of history, I think it's not finished. Like, cause I don't want to be the one, you know, that would be like Ben comes along and writes the story of Nardcore or Joe or Stu or whoever, and they could use those sources and do it. Now, as far as like the, the fun interviews where we do the discussions, I think that that we do a good job of putting that into context because the people I have on the show to discuss things are like people that I love and respect. And I respect their opinion. I respect like, you know, we're not doing hot takes to fucking burn people. We're basically like putting things on a pedestal that we love, that we want to like tell other people we love and put it in a, a historical context of why we love it and why we think it's important. You know, like that's the energy I want to put out from the pod. Yeah, I understand. I mean, there is a remit that we all agree on is, is try and be as positive as possible, like not, not trash things just for the sake of it. But um, I think positioning the podcast um, amongst all the, you know, other pods, some more popular than others that are out there for hardcore. I think what this podcast does, and I, and you know, you can correct me if, if you think I'm wrong. It does represent an underrepresented I mean, there's always been an East Coast bias in in hardcore anyway, um, just like there is in sports, you know, like the West Coast always gets the last, you know, I don't know, because three hours ahead, like people think that's more important or something. But um, I think that the West Coast being, you know, the focus of this and initially your hometown and your home scene is like, obviously that was important to you, but how did you um, go about making this different than what else is out there? Okay. Well, I do believe that that's true that there is an East coast bias in hardcore, although it might be justified because they have New York hardcore and they have DC, right? So it's like, that's insane. You know, it is like two of the the greatest things, like historically, like through the history of hardcore. Um, you know, now as far as the position of this podcast, yeah, I'm I'm trying to give glory to like, you know, my hometown, which is Oxnard and in the surrounding areas, and also to San Diego, and now California in general. Um, I just think it's important to to document this stuff. Like I, I, I don't know. Um, I think you do a good job explaining it better than me, Daniel, because. I'm like not an unbiased source here. Like I obviously think my podcast is the best, um, <laughs> but I'm biased. You know what I mean? Like I, yeah, well, I think it's a nice mix of opinion and like, and education, you know? And I think if there was going to, like, I can talk about what I think is negative about the podcast. Like, I think that like, although it's like, it's not just living in the past. Like we do, you know, we are like late late thirties, you know, thirties and 40 year old people, like we're waxing on what we like the most. And it does lean a little older, although not all the way back. Like maybe there's not enough talk of, of modern, modern stuff on here. And that's something that I would like to improve on. But, uh, yeah, but I do want, I think that's, a valid, oh, go that's ahead. a valid critique. I think that is a valid critique, but also you don't want to just fake the funk and talk about new stuff just for the sake of it and come off ill-informed you know yeah well i'm also just i've never been interested in like the horse race and the popularity like contest that is like a giant aspect of hardcore like just never been interested in that so like as far as like tracking like you know who's popular who's not who's doing well who's not like i don't really care i want everyone to succeed i think that's that's just the way i look at it so like i just want to talk about the things i like um, I'm not, I'm not really interested in like tracking that stuff as much. Um, you know, more so just like, 
I'd rather just talk every episode about how good the powerhouse record is and everyone needs to listen to it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, with the Super 7s that we've been doing, it, it's been opening us up to bounce around the country and perhaps internationally going forward as well of like picking, you know, the best from certain areas and shining lights on, on great scenes that we can, you know, that have changed dramatically over time, but you can pick, you know, something modern, something old. Um, how have you enjoyed that? The, um, for lack of a better term, fan base is getting so involved and you're actually getting the feedback and hearing back from from everyone who listens because I, I think that's been great. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, well, yeah, it's very rewarding to have people involved. So I love like, you know, everyone, Daniel does like the Instagram posts to like try to get that interaction and does a great job at it. And it is fun like when we do our Super 7s and to have people chime in like, here's what I would have chosen, you know, or I like this list cause this guy chose what or whatever the fuck. Um, it's cool. Again, I'm just surprised, <laughs> you know, like the last four years I've lost a lot of like, I mean, not that I had too much of a rosy outlook at humanity in general, but like, you know, the last four years have been a struggle for grabbing for something positive out of like the mass population. But I am like constantly surprised that I don't just constantly get called an idiot. Like, who the fuck is this guy? What a fucking poser. Like, shut up, stupid. Like, whatever, you know? Like, it is nice to get positive feedback and, and good critical feedback, you know? Instead of, like, no one's just jumping on saying, like, oh, Daniel's a fucking poser, you know? Like, that's nice. <laughs> well, good. Because <laughs> um, they, would, they would be wrong. <laughs> Daniel's a diehard. <laughs> the thing that, I, I mean, I, I've... I suppose I worded that a little bit wrong, but I'm really glad to see that the interaction of, of people who take even a minute out of their time to like vote and say something back, because I really like that you who puts a ton of hard work into this, um, start seeing that people are really appreciating it out there and that they are, you know, diving in and giving their opinion because, the actual the conversation matters you know and i think that that's fucking cool i mean we've got people listening all over the world and that's that would have blown your mind if we said this to you like around episode one time you know even though joe Rivas is the legend that the world needs to uh <laughs> bow down to. <laughs> yeah i know i i never had a uh <laughs> i never had a soccer allegiance you know outside of the Sholos before you know, except that, like we looked at like the the UK numbers, you know, and nailed down the neighborhood. And you're like, OK, I think those are Crystal Palace supporters. And I'm like, I'm on fucking board. Let's get out there in the street and fuck some people up. Yeah, you're a South London hooligan now. <laughs> yep. Shout out uh, Crystal Palace. Um, who is the dream interview that you've not grabbed yet that is like, you know, if anyone's listening right now and they can help it happen, who do you really want? Who are your top three that you need to get on this pod? Well, number one, like the failure would be if I don't get Doug Moody, right? Like, and he's agreed to it now. I just have to like figure it out. So like, hopefully Doug Moody comes on. I would love to do Pat Dubar. Um, try and track that down. Would love to do Gavin. Uh, we're tracking him down. Um, I'd like to do probably Mr. Brett would be big, you know, like to do the bad religion yeah. one. Um, you know, for the sake of the pod, we got to do smelly and noodles, you know, no, without no. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know. That's it. Like the, the thing is, like I've said, I, I'm not interested in like the popularity contest so much that I'm just, I like to do the interviews and give people their glory and like put everyone on a pedestal. Right. So it's like, I'm not, yeah, he, he would be great too. As would Lars, you know? Um, yeah. <laughs> the cool Lars, not the, not the little drummer boy, but, uh, yeah, like, I don't know. I want to, I want to, <laughs> I, I get excited about doing everyone, you know, and giving them their time to shine. Um, that's that. It's like, I, 
I don't know. There's only so much I can say on here, but like, I'm, I, I hope you guys always keep me grounded. I don't ever want to like break out of interviewing punk and hardcore people too much. You know, like I do want to do fun things like, you know, I did the stone age episode and there are like some certain non people that I'd like to do, but like, I want to keep it grounded in this, you know? So like, you know, if it's like if Mr. Brett's one week, like it's probably going to be, you know, someone small the next week, you know, like I'm not I'm not trying to hit like a a plateau and never go back. You know, what I mean, like I know what this pod is and like when it loses its like original intent, then I hope someone old yellers me, you know, at least take me out back and threaten to old yeller me. <laughs> All right. Well, do you feel well, well represented? <laughs> I do. That was a nice little chunk, Daniel. Thank you. All right, Stu. Let's do this. All right. You know him. You love him. He smashes his enemies from Oxnard to Chula Vista. <laughs> um, he, he doesn't wear a bandana and he's not straight edge. <laughs> and he loves Powerhouse. <laughs> Both of them. We Flor- got that. Florida and Oakland. <laughs> Yeah, we got Zach Nelson on the pod. Hey, uh, what for, up? You're on the pod. Thanks for having me, Stu. Appreciate that. Yeah, man. Um, so let's just dive into this. <laughs> um, <laughs> my questions are like a, a little more focused on you as a musician, aside from you being an interviewer. And so this is, these are just things that I would have wanted to know. Um, so hit, let's just go, dude. Um, what does Oxnard as a city mean to you? Well, um, it's where I grew up and like where I came up and it, it shaped me like for who I am. Like we're, uh, you know, not a big city, but we have a lot of people, you know, and we're very, I don't, I don't know if that's like a, a little bit of a chip on our shoulder or, or Maybe on the other end of it, like, I feel like we, we root for each other, like in punk and hardcore to try to like put each other on a pedestal. And I think that, you know, one of the best things about hardcore is it's always like hearkening back, you know, like it's always given respect to the people that came before you. Um, You know, even like if you go see negative approach, like they, they're covering like the weirdos and they're covering like Borstal breakout and shit. Like, you know, even like, a uh, OG ass band like Navy approach is like, yo, here's the shit that got us here, you know? Yeah. And, and I, I think that like, you know, coming from a scene where, where it's not LA or DC or New York, you know, maybe we pump it to like that extra level. And, you know, we always try to like hype the stuff, you know, before us. I mean, that's been like, you know, almost all my bands as soon as like I got to adulthood was, was trying to like, you know, in control, we, we literally were trying to put Nardcore like back on the map on the U S level, you know what I mean? And touring and raising that flag and and so forth. So, you know, but so that's like the punk thing. The other thing of Nard is like, I'm super glad that I grew up somewhere so multicultural, you know, and not just like, not just black and white and Mexican, but like Asian and Pacific Islander. Like we got everything, you know what I mean? And like, it's, you know, I talked a little bit, you know, just now about like, you know, humanity in the last four years and feeling out of touch with the way some people are. Like, I don't understand how people don't look at everyone just as people. Like, the idea of racism is so, like, foreign to me, you know, and I, I don't mean to yeah. seem like, like woke or something by saying that, but it's just like, what the fuck is that? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like seriously grew up around everyone that like, I don't think about that shit. You know what I mean? And so it's like, it almost seems like sometimes I feel like extra disgusted by it because it's like, what is this fucking weirdness? So I don't know. That's, I don't know if that explained anything about how I feel about Nard. I don't know if you can ever describe where you came from, you know, like, sure. But is it is interesting, you know. One of my favorite Tom Waits lines is like, "Never knew my hometown till I like moved away," like something like that, you know. And 
you know, I lived in San Diego now for 14 years and I'm always nostalgic about Nard, you know, obviously. Obviously, you don't hold pot about it, you know, or at least the beginning of it. That's what's so cool is just how much it's grown. And I'm just, I'm stoked on that. And I'm stoked for you on what you've done with it. Yeah, I mean, like, I hope... 100 100 episodes, dude. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, I hope that people don't think that, like, I've moved on from that. Because it's more so that, like, that was... I wanted to get everyone interviewed. And so I kind of went gung-ho and interviewed almost everyone right away. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like... You got it out of the way. (laughs) Not not to say that, you know, but, like, you did. No, it's like, I, I don't... Like, I did the Tony Cortez interview. I don't... I my plan was to get a lot of those people done and then kind of have like party episodes where like, okay, I did Tony Cortez and Brandon Cruz. Now let me have Tony Cortez and Brandon Cruz on together and let's just tell some stories and have some laughs. That was my original idea, but then COVID hit and like, there's a lot of shit that just changes when you're not in person. You know what I mean? Like those, those episodes would only work if we were all sitting around a table. It doesn't work the same, like over the phone. So I hope that when we pull out of this, like we can go and do that. Like I would like to have more fun episodes of like old school dudes, like telling stories, you know, and that would be good for having some like ancillary dudes on too. Like, you know, I did one roadies episode, you know, but I would like to do more of that. That'd be awesome. Yeah. I'd love to see that. Hear that. Um, All right. Next one. Uh, What in control song means the most to you? Oh, I don't know. Um, I guess like two towers still gets me in the feels, <laughs> you know what I mean? I guess yeah, that yeah, for sure that and once upon a town, like, you know, the two pussy songs, they always get me in the feels like, and they're so short. <laughs> they're so short. They're so short and good. And I love them. They're my little babies, you know, that I was a little shy about at first, but, uh, you know, they're not as ugly anymore. Yeah, dude. And then soon to be is in my town. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. I mean, I love that song. It was, you know, I just got swept up in like the, the energy that we were putting into like doing a new Nardcore comp. Right. And it's like, everyone's writing songs. Everyone's excited. And I was like, man, I don't want to see this list of bands without in control on it. Like I just got to do this, you know? And then there was so much, (laughs) so much pressure after like, you know, not, not writing a song for, 15 years like okay what single song do you want to put out there like how's it gonna be you know because like realistically retaliate coup d'etat is the next in control record like i wrote all the music and all the lyrics for in control and i basically did that for the first retaliate record or like most of it you know so like that's that it's just drop tuned you know but i think that like if in control was going to do more stuff than I would want to go like a little more like verbal assaulty, but it's like, I just don't have that in me to like do a single song and come back like that. So you just had to do a rager dude. Fuck it. Yeah. You did a rager. You did a song that I've heard described as a GBH ish. And that's fucking sick. Yeah, dude. Yeah, dude. All right. Um, do you ever see retaliate? Uh, who Vince uh, describes as the mad ball of Oxnard. Do you see Retaliate breaking up when being such a staple Nardcore band? No, I hope we never break up. That's all point of Retaliate. Yeah. Is, uh, you know, I, it, look, hardcore is hardcore, right? And like, I think that the, I have the utmost respect for bands that like do hardcore music full time. That is fucking gnarly, you know? And it's like, they live it, they breathe it pass off much respect, but for like the majority of people, like, you know, we got to work, you know, like not everyone can make a living doing it. And like, you know, or have, <laughs> you know, I don't know. Like it's just, it was never in the cards for us. And I, I just think that like, we love making music together. Like it's all still the same dudes, you know, and you guys are just friends, man. It's just friends hanging out, making music. Yeah, the best part about it. Yeah, and I think that that's like something that like I hope is infectious. You know, like bands, you don't have to come out with like a a mission statement and like either succeed or don't. Right, like just get in a room with people you love and make music together and be creative 
And like, you know, I don't think that my passion for playing music is, is lesser than people that do it full time. You know, I think that like every time we put out music or every time we play, you know, we're on that level. It's just, we're, we made a, you know, our intent was never to be a full-time band, you know, and we've yeah. been able to sustain ourselves. And like, I love seeing those guys, you know what I mean? Like, look, I did a band where we toured and shit and like, it sucks to start hating your best friends. Right. Like that is a feeling that I never wanted to have again. And like, yeah. I think that if you ask people that tour, you know, they, you, that is just like inevitable reality because like you start being business partners with like people that were your creative partners. Like, it's just like, it's diametrically opposed to like the way it's like supposed to be, you know, but they, most people make it work because they have that passion and they have that drive. And that's why it's so respectable and commendable, you know, but like for me, I, I was there and like, I don't want to dislike my friends, you know, I don't want to like feel that way about them and like doing it in this way is like, it means we can be around forever. You know? I mean, I guess if like Verity gets hit by a bus or something, like, I don't know if we would replace him. Like that would be the end of the band. Like it can't be retired. Yeah, definitely. Us, but, but like, but, you know, yeah, we're that Verity's voice in there, dude. You can't. Yeah. I mean, he's so crucial, but yeah, I hope we never break up. I hope you guys don't break up either. Um, Thank you. If you could boil your uh, guitar influences for In Control to three guitar players, who would you pick? Oh, I don't know because you know what? I'm actually a pretty terrible guitarist. Like, I'm like one of those dudes that can like play my songs, and I never sat down and like bothered learning other people's songs unless we were doing a cover. And I think that's why I never got really good at guitar because like. I enjoy creating, but I don't enjoy like practicing or getting good or anything. You know, I will say this, like recently I've been listening to a lot of uh, hoods again. And I think that a lot yeah. of my songwriting shit came from like the way the hoods used to like do their songs. And I was like kind of blown away by it. Like listening to that alone EP, I'm like, Oh my God, that's like half of my influence right there. Like, fuck. You know, I guess I'm lucky that thing went out of print. <laughs> no, it's it's true though. Like that, like when I hear the the Nardcore Seven Inch, I hear a lot of the powerhouse just on that speed level, and then and then a lot of hoods alone as well. Just like how fast that whole thing is, and like Tony's double kick and all that stuff. I, I feel like does he? He just does the do cat do cat do that. He doesn't do do that that. He's doing do that that do that that do that that do that. But he's doing that. but he's doing double time. <laughs> Yeah, it's so fucking good. Yeah, Tony's a man. He's a man, dude. I mean, um, anyone that can find his way back from Dallas is the man. <laughs> dude. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't put in on this. You didn't put in on this. Shit. Fuck. Super. Check out that new charm, man. That shit is fucking sick. So good. So good. Um. All right, dude. Last in control question. What lineup of IC played the tightest? And um, what, if you can remember, what were some of those standout shows playing with that lineup? <laughs> when In Control was the tightest was like the very end. And uh, it's when we, I think we had Chris Chassie on second guitar, who like from Reach the Sky that went on and did Rise Against, and then Todd Jones was playing bass. Like we were pretty good right then. In fact, I was so washed up that I like didn't even go to a couple practices. Like I, I can't you did not show up. Yeah, I can't overstate like how washed up I was when I was like twenty three or twenty four. I was a total piece of Jesus shit. Christ. Yeah, like it was like ah, oh, these guys got it. I don't gotta go, you know. And uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's kind of embarrassing. But yeah, that was raging. But then obviously, like you know, the reunions because like it's basically a retaliate. You know what I mean? But yeah, the final get troll lineup. Hey, we. In Control always had trouble, like, you know, once Tony left, it was hard to find a good drummer again because, like, Matt was 16, and there just weren't that many drummers that could, like, do it. And then, like, we always had trouble keeping a bass player. We could never find a second guitarist. And, like, we're a band that would have been much, much better served by having a second guitar, you know? And so, like... Did you always want to have a second guitarist, or when did that come into play? When you when did you realize that you wanted another 
Oh, on another the, guitar player to beef the, it up on the first LP. Like we had, to, uh, we had to, right? Because if we wanted to play a song like "Victims of Progress," you have to have two guitars, you know. And so, like, it is kind of weird to have a song like that and like never play it on tour, you know? Because like we weren't representing our band well enough. But the problem is, <clears throat> we were at a really, we came out in a weird time in hardcore, you know, like when, uh, like Poison the Well was fucking huge. So like everyone that wanted to like play guitar, like really wanted a noodle, you know what I mean? And so. Or they wanted to play like, you know, punk, like simple shit. And like In Control is like such a weird band in the way that it's like, it's definitely not technical at all, but there's lots of starts and stops and changes that it's like, you got to be good enough at guitar to play it, but like you can't be too good or you're going to get bored playing it. You know what I mean? But then you can't be shitty or you can't play it. (laughs) You know what I mean? It's like, it's this weird like intermediary stuff that like, Basically, if you're a good guitarist, you'd get bored of playing, you know, I think. I don't know. But, yeah, it was just really hard. But I know that every time that we tried to have a second guitarist, like, it was just a fucking travesty. Sucks. Yeah, whatever. Dude. But uh, Chassis did um, pretty good. Uh, and I would like to think we catapulted him to uh, Rise Against. Dude, definitely. <laughs> That's what I think too. You fucking threw me for a loop. Like I had to like double take when you said res again. <laughs> yeah. So sick. All right, dude. Out of all the members of Ill Repute, which one was your favorite? Uh, on the on the podcast, interview wise. Well, I think uh, personality wise, me and Jim are like pretty similar. So I'm on Team Jim. How about that? Although I, nice. I, will, I will say this. It's like, I can't, how do you say your favorite, like your repute? Like they all rule. So Carl, he's so infectious and like, he just like, he's so excited, you know? And like that rules, like that is inspirational. You know, anytime someone's like a full generation older than you and is just that fired up and stoked to talk about anything. And like, you know, we wrapped it up and he's like, I got to find these demos and send them to you and this and that. I'm like, fuck yeah like that's what it's all about you know what i mean and then it's like tony yeah and he's the fucking mayor of oxnard you know what i mean like tony's a man he's like the nard spirit animal you know and J- john he's like he's too good looking <laughs> so who, we don't need to say anything nice about john you know it's like if you're gifted with those looks and can surf like that like ah, oh, whatever but uh yeah and then jim i i just resonate with him Kind of like a, a straightforward, grumpy, low key funny guy. So <laughs> he's my dude, you know. That's what I would say. All right, Thanks, dude. Thanks, Stu. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, that's all I got. Yeah, Bedge. Let's do this. What up? Um, what up? Cold, all right. cold chilling. Cold chilling. That's what. That's how you want me to introduce myself. That's what I shall do. Um. Question number one, when are you going to interview me? Uh, well, first off, you have to put out a good record. Oh, dang. <laughs> that's, that's bullshit. From the top rope. <laughs> Skate punk and the seven inch. Chef's kiss. Moi. Yeah. yeah. No, Thank you, Dan. And I put out a good book, so you have to interview me. Oh. But uh, um, hey, if you look up any feel, if you look up any fields of fire picture, it's like, oh, there's Zach, one of three dudes singing along. So ob- I'm an obvious. <laughs> that's, that's true. Yeah. I've always noticed that obvious supporter of the band. Yeah. So um, back to that question: When are you going to interview me? Oh well, yeah. I, there, there's gonna. I'm gonna have to do an episode 250 one day. You know what's funny is you we we were gonna we were gonna make this work. I was gonna even drive to San Diego to do it in person, and then I was like, I, I, I can do it. It was in like it was, I think it was in December, and I'm like, I can do it next month. I can do it in January, or February, or whenever. And you're just like, look, there's a lot of people ahead of you. There are a lot of people that I still need to interview. Okay, it's, you're not the priority or anything. You gave me some really like short like like kind of like harsh answer and then of course COVID happened and so 
I don't know. You still do. Let's wait until we're able to do it in person. Let's wait till episode 500 when the pandemic is over. What do you say? Yeah. <laughs> what, what a surprise. Zach was harsh to bed. Yeah. No, what a surprise. Never happened in the history of our friendship. Look, I just, um, I'm going to have to do all the guys from the Grim first, and then we'll get to you, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> you mean that mm. shitty backyard band? No, the Grimm's cool, man. Actually, I'm I love do, that band. I'm gonna do Tim Grimm. Oh, no, they're soon. great. I'm gonna do Tim soon, but uh, I gotta I gotta do the third bass player first, and then uh, and then we'll get you on there. <laughs> Sweet. Yo, which ba- which bass uh, player is that, Joe? <laughs> I don't. It, 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 where's, where's Joe to tell us who the third bass player of the Grimm was? <laughs> <laughs> I think I know who it is. It's Brian. Uh, from Drughead's Revenge. Am yep. I right, Joe? I'm pretty sure you Woo! are. Dude. What was interesting hey. about Brian's bass rig is that he uh, <laughs> used his rings upside down. And Brian had a print, sh- he had a print shop, uh, maybe he still does, Atomic Print, uh, Atomic was the name of it, and he would, he made t-shirts for my old band Bad Reaction, and he gave me an uh, Ampeg hooded sweatshirt because uh, he would bootleg, um, he had made like bootleg like guitar equipment shirt. Like if you wanted an MXR shirt, like he had, he had that just kind of like pretty random. Anyway, moving on. Um, do you think that the whole thing about starting in Oxnard and then you're expanding out to California, West coast, then East coast, then I guess the world is, do you think that's a good strategy to increase listenership or is it strictly just like tackling your interests in order of, of importance? Uh, okay. Well, I, I want to document the stuff that I want to like document first. Right. So it's like part personal preference, but also like, I do think it's good to have a little bit of a niche, you know, especially now, like there, there are a ton of hardcore podcasts and I, I pretty much listen to all of them. They're all like really good. Um, but like, you know, some that have, (laughs) what, (laughs) It wasn't me. What? 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 Who was okay. that? It was probably Daniel. All right, back to mute, guys. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think having a niche can like be good to get like, you know, some some support because people know what you're gonna do. Like, if I was bouncing around all the time, then maybe some people wouldn't know what to expect. I do want a little bit of of like knowing what to expect in the pod, and like I think people do. You know, it's like interview, then it's discussion, then it's interview, then it's discussion. And I'm mostly interviewing, you know, California punk and hardcore people right now, um, just because I think it's like kind of underrepresented, you know, which, Ben, is that a word? Underrepresented? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, it's a word that's being used a lot um, nowadays because, you know, in the context of women are underrepresented in hardcore, uh, people of oh, color yeah, yeah, are yeah, underrepresented yeah, yeah. in yeah. corporate positions. Yeah. Um, but that, that goes, that leads into my next question, which is why do you think within hardcore since about, I would put, I would put it somewhere around 1986, the East coast becomes a shot caller and the West coast struggles for respect. Because if you look at another genre like hip hop, which, which started on the East coast, the, it went, the, the focus of power moved around from the East coast to the West coast, back to the East and eventually into the South. Like it shifted around a lot, whereas you have the you have hardcore beginning in the West Coast in Southern California, and then it kind of shifts to you know DC a little bit, and then and then kind of New York, and then it just never leaves New York. Like what, what accounts for that? And don't just say because New York has a lot of good records. There are a lot of good records from a lot of from a lot of places. Yeah, but that's the most important thing, right? Is like like New York literally never fell off. Like there's no weird downtime. Like I guess there could be oh, if, if totally, there totally is well, early nineties. Yeah, like in your opinion, you know. But like I like a lot of that stuff, you know. All right. So I mean, like if you're following the journey of of New York hardcore, which like is obviously like different, like pre and post one voice. Like if you like all the post one voice stuff, and like I mean, some of Sick of All's best records are right then, right? And you got like Madball, the early twenty five of life, like all that stuff is great in my opinion, you know, so like it never falls off. It just like kind of evolves. Um, 
But I do take what you're saying, like, you know, how hip hop bounces around. I do think that's how it ended up. Cause like there's big bands from all over now. I mean, that knocked loose band is one of the biggest bands of hardcore and they're from Kentucky, you know, that's super ill. Right. And you know, California has some of the biggest hardcore bands too, right? Like rotting out and terror. Right. So ceremony ceremony. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, <laughs> Ben, I, yeah, I should be interviewing you cause you, you know, the answer is better than me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, that's good. Cause I, I, yeah. Um, I, I think so, that's why, though, it never fell off. Like, I mean, all, there there's that weird gap, right, in, like, California, probably, which is, like, the 85 through until Suffer. So, like, a three-year gap. And then also, like, California gets lumped in with, like, because it birthed all the, like, the Epifat stuff, right? So, it kind of right. gets lumped off yeah. that way of, like, you know, that stuff didn't hold up to a lot of people. It, it did hold up to me. You know, but I don't think that that style of music even exists anymore, really. Like, because most of those bands all stopped playing fast, like by the year 2000, and it kind of like merged into like that vagrant record sound, you know? Like, they all just like kind of slowed down. Like, is anyone still playing fast? Like, I guess Lagwagon, right? So, yeah. of that, of that, that um, early 90s pop punk. Yeah. Um, like, like, did anyone really see those bands? Yeah. Right, and then like, can Shoot. you? Do you think I'm gonna listen to a lag? You think I'm gonna listen to the last lag wagon album to no, find I, out? I'm sorry, that's so mean, but come on. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> good. Then, it's that, good. That's the okay, that's, okay. That's, but that's the other thing, though, is like uh, there there aren't like new like bands coming up like playing that style. Like it's kind of like the, it's, hey, it's like this, this is where I'm gonna just say shout out to Fly Slaughter because they're the only band playing that, and their LP is gonna be coming out pretty soon. Right on. I don't know, but that that song on the comp doesn't sound like that. That doesn't sound like Fat. Records. No, but but the whole the whole LP sounds like Fat Record. You would love it, dude. All right, I can't wait. So that's cool. Right. That's cool. They're still in their thirties now, right? Yeah. So it's like you don't yeah, have like seventeen year old 30. kids coming out playing that. So I don't know. Definitely not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I mean, like even All for right. them, it's like well, nostalgia of like bringing back a sound. Yeah. Yeah. Um. What have you thought of doing the pot? I mean, this doesn't apply to right now because we're in a pandemic, but have you ever thought of doing the podcast in front of a live audience? Um, I don't know how that would play out. Like, cause, okay. So I went and saw one dude do a radio show, like live. Who the fuck was his name? He was like, he's like this, uh, talk radio, like kind of like a misogynist dude. It was like kind of popular for a while. Oh, Tom Likas. Yeah. Tom Likas. Yeah. I went and saw him live and it was just kind of like bogus. So sick. You know? Yeah. I saw Tom Likas. And he was just like, hello, Tom. <laughs> and he like, he's right. like, zip me up, Tom. Zzz. You know, or blow me up, Tom, whatever. Terrible. <laughs> I just, it was, it, it was just like bad. Like, you know, half the people aren't paying attention and like, you know, this, this, it, this is for a captive audience. Don't you think like, I don't know if it's for a live thing, you know? Yeah. I was going to say, I've heard, I've never been in a room witnessing someone do a live podcast that I can think of, but I've heard a bunch and it doesn't, it like doesn't sound as good. Like I don't care that they're doing it. And it always just sounds like it's 20 people and like, yeah, half of them aren't paying attention. So yeah, I, I'm team, I'm team avoid that, but, but you know, Cool well, there's also mind. there's I'm also like, a little more pandering to the crowd, so it's like you're changing the format completely, you know, like yeah, yeah. because yeah. Uh, I don't, you know, I don't want to talk politics on the podcast too much, but like I listen to like the Pod Save America guys, you know, and like they went and they did like a giant outdoor one, like you know, ten thousand people or some shit, and it's just like I don't know, or they did a bunch of live ones actually, and it's just like the the format when they're doing a podcast, it changes when they're doing a live. And it's like, I don't like to listen to the live ones as much. Cause it's like almost a different format. It's like, you're losing the original intent of why I'm listening. Yeah, totally. I agree. Um, would it bother you if someday at some point in the future, you were more known as someone who does a podcast than someone who plays music? I mean, that might already be the case. So yeah. You know what I mean? It's like I interview people that don't know that I'm in a band. So, but hey, they're stoked. Can you imagine have having never heard Retaliate and getting to hear it for the first time? It's like, 
Fuck. <laughs> Score. I can't. I, I can't imagine. <laughs> um, oh, no. So, so it doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't. I don't have okay, a huge ego. Good. Um. What? Okay, you you talk about this a lot, and I think about this every day. You, you talk about being 24 years old and being totally jaded on hardcore, and then you say like, you know, a year later you kind of snapped out of it. Um, what what snapped you out of it? Like, what brought you back from being jaded in when I guess that would have been 2000, like towards the end of In Control, right? Yeah, yeah. So like the final year in Control, I was just like pretty bummed out, you know, because like. I wanted to do it as a full-time band and shit. We just couldn't hold it together with members. And then it was like, we kind of did one of those slow breakups. Like we said we were breaking up and then played probably like, you know, seven more shows before our last show. Like in the year 2004, I think we played six shows and we might've said like, yeah, we're going to do a few shows and then probably break up. And it was like, Oh, then we got popular. You know what I mean? And so it's kind of like, what the fuck? You know what I mean? Like if, if, it would have been cool if people liked us last year <laughs> that maybe we wouldn't be breaking up. You know what I mean? So I think that like yeah. did a little bit of it. And then like, you know, we broke up and then it's like, you know, I think that anyone that doesn't live a traditional lifestyle, like that age 24 is like kind of a weird one. Like just that span. I don't know when it hits people like 23 to 26, 27, you know, like obviously if you're a dude that comes out of high school, goes to college, meets your wife, starts having a family, then like it is what it is. But like, if you're not that, you know, you're like 24 and it's like, you know, I was working like fucking sandwich shops and shit and like, didn't really know what I was doing with my life. It's like, what the fuck is going on here? Like I was just at a bad place, you know? And, uh, Mm -hmm. so I started working like full-time jobs and shit. And, and then, you know, like that part of my life is going pretty good. Like, you know, I liked my roommate (laughs) <laughs> like I don't know, whatever. But like, I started getting like nostalgic for all the things that I loved about hardcore, right? Like when you you step away, I never stopped going to shows or anything. But like, you know, I stopped being musical for a full year. You know, like the year two thousand five, I didn't do anything. You know, and I got that itch, and I wrote about it. It's uh the song "My Love Is Real" on the second Retaliate LP. I write about it. Um. So if you want the answer in poetic form, you can check it out there, bitch. But basically that's, it It was just just like taking a, it was taking a step back and being like, you shouldn't take any of this shit for granted. You know what I mean? Because like the fact that we get to play music and, you know, a few people are interested in it. Like that's a blessing that can go away any day. You know what I mean? Like those motherfuckers like playing it, like, you know, some badass guitarist is like playing in a corner in a fucking tapas restaurant, you know what I mean? And no one gives a fuck about that guy. And like that guy's way better music than me. You know what I mean? So it's like, if you can, if you have like the ability to like play a show and have a handful of people sing along and like put music out, which is timeless and never goes away. Like we need to really cherish these moments, you know? And that's, I changed my outlook. And when we brought retaliate back, in like whatever late 05, early 06, like that was the outlook. And that's kind of why, like, you know, earlier talking about why we never did it as a full-time band. Like that's the reason I didn't want to have like those feelings against like band members of like being upset with them and like being burnt out on hardcore and like that shit. It's like, I want hardcore to like always be a blessing. And like, I, that's, I changed my outlook and I've never, I've never felt differently. You know what I mean? Like, I've loved hardcore ever since. Yeah. That's such a, that's so much healthier than, than, uh, my outlook. <laughs> you're whatever you're doing, you're doing it right. I, Cause you know, I, I never stopped playing music, but, but th- there was definitely a point right around the same t- age you were. Of course I'm two years older. So two years before that, but like, I just decided like, God, man, being, being a band and being in a band in the hardcore scene is starting to feel more like a, an obligation than something fun. And when you stop liking, when you can't find anything new to get into that's coming down the pipeline, um, it's just like, oh, what I have to like, you kind of you kind of start feeling like a politician or like you have to like 
get to be friends from band in order to get a show and then and then watch them play when they play like just imagine a hardcore scene where you didn't like any bands or you only like two bands or something and you're not playing every show with the two bands you like and so it's like maybe that's it maybe you you just within hardcore you have a more open-minded like you're just into more types of hardcore than i am so there was always something that you could latch on to like i never was into the thuggy type stuff and you you are and the more metallic stuff and that's probably that probably has a lot to do with it too i'm sorry i'm just theorizing and not interviewing you no i think it's fine i think it's interesting like i don't know like there there's a lot of different subgenres that you could have like dipped your toes in. Like obviously many people did, right? Like if you like, I don't know, both Wes and Ryan George, like went and became pretty successful in like, you know, a music genre that's like maybe just one over adjacent. Right. So like, I don't know, maybe do you feel like you never opened yourself up to like other stuff? No, I mean, Eventually, you know, I was doing the, the kind of more early 80s style uh, hardcore punk thing with Bad Reaction. And then and then a scene formed that we fit into better about four years after we started playing. I mean, it was bad timing on our part. But that was a kind of a cool thing, that whole No Way thing, like in the late 2000s. But it never felt the same. It never felt like, you know, going to uh, laser star in the late nineties. Like I ne- it was never that vibe again where it was all where you, I was just like, this is the scene. There's six bands playing. I'm stoked to see every one of these bands. I'm going to sing along to all of them. It's like, I mean, that feeling never came back for me, but that's, that's okay. Whatever. Like I, I, I'm finding stuff I'm into just as much as anybody else these days. It's well, just, you can never recapture yeah. your youth again. Right. And so, like, yeah. don't don't kill yourself trying. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's, right. just, it's just, like, a sad fact of getting older. You know, it's like many of us have talked on the 7-inch about, like, for instance, loving the Rancor 7-inch, right? If a band mm-hmm. – if, if that 7-inch came out now with, like, the 18-year-old kids put out, like, we could listen to it and be like, this is cool, but I don't think it would connect with us the same way that it did back then, Right. Right. Yeah, you're probably right. So you just can't yeah. chase that. Yeah, totally. Um, when are we going to hear another story time with Forrest? That's another one that I just think works like in person more so than like on the phone. Although like, right. I think, I guess we could just do it on the phone, but it's more fun to like get in a room and like, <laughs> you know, like Forrest comes into like a 15 minute guest spot, but he shows up with like a six pack and a couple buddies. It's so, like, it's so good. He's got to like, he's got to get, he's got to get loose first, you know, the, like the whole, 10 cigarettes. Yeah. It's like, all right, I gotta, I gotta smoke seven cigarettes, drink six buds, you know, and then I'll tell like a five minute story, you know, it's like, got to. yeah. TKs. So you just gotta like, I don't know. It's, you got, you gotta witness the whole process and like, it just wouldn't be the same <laughs> over the phone. Right. So, but I, you could do, you could do an outdoor social distance kind of two mics, you know, 10, uh, 15 feet apart from each other type of setup, I suppose. Still, this would be the same. Like, I just. Yeah, yeah. Look, there's certain things that we're looking forward to, like coming out of this COVID shit. And uh, I would just say that Storytime with Forrest is top five for me. So. Uh, right. Something to look forward um, to. You'll be Next happy to hear that. Yeah. Um. Next question is, when are you going to run out of material? I feel like I do every week. That's <laughs> that's what I'm so worried about. And Daniel thinks I'm neurotic. Um, but, hey, what are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know. You're I mean, neurotic. Will we ever? I guess at some point we no. just talk about nothing. And uh, that'll be fine. You know? I am just I try to keep it super focused now just because that's what I really like. You know, everyone is good at different things, and I generally enjoy most things I listen to. But uh, this, I like it to be, like, kind of anal and super focused, and and that's that. And I don't know. I don't know when we'll run out of material. I don't, like, not that I'm comparing myself this way at all, but, like, 
more so I, I think of it as a musical example of something I'm envious of. Like my music, I always like hoard it, you know, it's like, I want to hang on to it. I'm so like, I'm not prolific. I don't like put out a bunch of shit. Like I, I think about it and like, you know, if I have a riff, I'm going to save it until it's like the right time to use it. Right. And I'm so envious of like someone like Bob Dylan. It's like, fuck it. I'm just putting out like records, you know? And it's like, just like some people, they just record music, put it out, record music, put it out, record music, put it out like the Rolling Stones or some shit. Right. And some of it hits and some of it doesn't and it doesn't seem to affect them either way. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> I'm so fucking envious of that, you know, instead of worrying about every little fucking thing. So like, you know, I just need to keep plugging away with this and putting out content. Like that's the goal. Right. And don't worry about running out of shit because something will come along, you know, I guess. But uh, uh, that's what I'm trying to do, at least. Yeah, there was that whole five best seven inches or five best albums of, of a five-year chunk of time type thing. You you, you still got a few of those to go. Yeah, that'll get four more episodes, right? Because uh, we only went up to the year 2000, <laughs> dating ourselves. Like, oh, what, came <laughs> af- what came after that? <laughs> well, I don't know. Yeah, get Mike, you got to get Mike Hood. That's that's all I'm saying. Yeah, Mike Hood's <laughs> one of the ones I want to get. But again, like another person, I was going to, be, before COVID hit, I wanted to do, actually, I just didn't get around doing it last year. I was trying to go up and watch a Raiders game before they moved and then like do Powerhouse and Hoods and uh, some more base stuff up there. But it just didn't happen. And then like trying to plan it out, then COVID hits and it is what it is, right? But Mikey Hood's someone that I think I should do in person. This would have been the last season the Raiders played in Oakland, right? Yeah, so last year. This is the first one in Vegas. Okay. Um, do you think? What do you? Do you think episode one hundred eighty-five? You got to make that one a big deal, right? There's got to be something special about that one. Yeah, I mean, like that's basically the second episode one hundred, right? Like, look, yeah. look, it's weird. Like being an adult, I, I try to not make a big deal about like my birthday or anything, you know? And it's kind of like a depressing thing when you get old, like, you know, Oh, your 37th birthday. Like maybe just no one fucking tells you happy birthday all day. You know what I mean? Like you never know. Like these things can get sad when you get older. Um, and so like, I don't know if we need to make a big deal about the shit, but look, I think that like this, this podcast is, it's a group effort. Like whatever my name's on it. I do a lot of the work, but like it wouldn't exist without the help of, of you, Ben and Joe and Stu and Dan and Chris and Kim and like everyone that's, you know, been interviewed on here and everyone that helps out and the patrons. So like, I really do feel like this is a group effort, which is why, like, you know, for this episode 100, we did this stupid thing of being interviewed and, and we're, you know, talking about it being episode 100 and kind of like trying to celebrate in the lamest fucking COVID way possible. Right. Oh, five guys on the phone. This is sick party you know <laughs> like yeah. but, but like well i mean like i i am proud of it and i'm like i hope you guys are proud of it too like having a piece of it and uh yeah Absolutely. i think that 185 is is gonna be it'll be a fun one we'll come up with something better to do than fucking interview my stupid ass you know <laughs> like well, we're gonna make 185 the episode that 100 should have been but failed to be god damn it um <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was I was because to be like every couple of years there would be a band like Instead or Gorilla Biscuits that would do a reunion show and it felt like a reunion for the audience as well like I'd see multiple generations of hardcore kids from my past that I don't see on a regular basis and like being on this pod kind of feels like the way those shows feel because you know um you know, it's it's not the main goal of the podcast, but it's like a way for me to connect with guys like you and, and Jeff Banks and Steve Larson and, you know, talking about them on their Patreons and having them, you know, hit me up afterwards and say they heard it. It's it's cool. It's like it's basically an excuse to connect with people, you know, well, yeah, to get I mean, that like, vibe. Look, of course, I feel the same way. Of course, a yeah. huge part of hardcore is the community of it. Right. And seeing your friends right. and like. I think that that's something that we're all suffering from this year of not being able to go to shows is like, 
you know, when you're hardcore, you have like, you know, a handful of good friends, but you have like a dick ton of fucking acquaintances, <laughs> you know? And like, I miss my acquaintances too. God damn it. You know, I haven't gotten yeah. to see like all these people that I usually see at shows. And so like, I think that the podcast is a little bit of that, like a community of people that can like tune in and like, listen to some people they consider their friends talk every week. You know what I mean? And like, different people participate and again like you know like those dudes reaching out to you badge like that feels good you know and like I, i'm sure a bunch of people reached out to them when they were on the pod and it felt good and like i i like that like that's literally the most reporting piece of the pod you know or like when uh two dudes that i don't know like talking to rob and he's like man i really like joe you know it's like oh that's yeah. sick like one of my friends likes another one of my friends but they never met like that's ill as yeah. fuck like that stuff is what makes it all worth it. You know, I think, did that answer your question? Totally. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. It's funny. It's like, I, I think I communicate with you, Zach, more than anyone else. I mean, outside of my girlfriend who I live with, but you know, like, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to, t- I don't like, want to take it to that level, would've... dude. I'm, I'm a very, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm a very open-minded person, but uh, that won't end up well for you. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> hey. um, that's a picture I didn't need in my. Hey, it's episode. But isn't that weird so... though? Yeah, you never would have expected that, though, right? <laughs> no, but it's like one of the greatest things. Like, you know, I mean, look, I, I, Daniel was one of my best, my best friends for a long, long time, and. You know, I think that that's, I'm not a very outgoing person in general. And so like for the people that I consider my best friends, like I don't feel it necessary to always reach out to them, you know? And then like, you just, it's weird how life happens, you know? And like, it'll just be like, fuck, I haven't talked to Ryan in like six months. You know what I mean? Like, and a lot of shit can go down to six months, you know? So like, that's been another really rewarding thing is like reconnecting with Daniel and having him on here all the time. You know, because like he's someone that I, I lean on a lot for this stuff. You know. Well, I mean, we hadn't talked in sixteen or seventeen years. You know, that's a big deal. Like, it's not like we were like the we were we were best friends. You know, the last time we had anything to do with each other. So it's kind of like, yeah, it's it's cool, and it's strange that, you know, we text each other bullshit about hardcore every single day, like. <laughs> Yeah, I know, but wouldn't, but wouldn't have thought that. But Ben, I I like talking to Daniel. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm, fucking, I'm fucking around. <laughs> nah, Ben, I love what talking to you. Steel chair, that I, one. I love talking to you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, nah, and I I will say because you come, you always do your homework, which is fucking impressive. Like you, yeah, you really have it together for this format. But then also, like you low key, like really know how to take a joke. And that's the only reason why, like I dish it out. It's all with love. And I, I know, you know that. Well, and I, I, um, not low key. Absolutely. Didn't know how to take a joke 18 years ago. So see that, that has changed. So yeah. See growing yeah. Uh, some, some things like getting older, it gets better, you know, <laughs> sometimes not so because stage diving is harder these days. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, like, there's like, there's reg, there's like regular person midlife crisis, which we're kind of creeping up on really quickly here. But then there's also like hardcore kid midlife crisis. And I think we were both going through that, you know, when we were, uh, you know, touring the country together and not, not being, not being very nice to each other. So that was, I feel you. That was then. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, that's I, all I, I got, man. I've enjoyed reconnecting with you, Ben, and it's it's been fun. I enjoy talking to you a lot. I think Ben has added a, a ton of greatness to the pod. Absolutely. Appreciate it, Dan. Yeah. So Dan and- anything you guys want to talk about together before we wrap this up, if uh if anyone's still listening? I would like to <laughs> to hear uh from everyone why or why not? Fugazi is a hardcore band. <laughs> oh yeah, I love, it. I love it. I love it. Let's do it. Ben, let's go to you first. Um, I think ethically they are, but musically they're not. 
So I'm going to go 50, 50. I'm going to go straight down the middle. I'm going to, I'm going to break it out like that because ethically, how can you deny it? Like no one has reached the level of popularity they did ever in the history of the world. And then kept the hardcore ethic completely intact. Like they're, that's never happened before or since. And, and, but musically they're not doing the, you know, they're not doing the fast beat. They're not like, it's not hardcore music. Um, but like, does it matter? You either like the music or you don't. And then you appreciate what they've, what they've done with their, you know, $5 shows playing to, you know, 3000, uh, capacity venues, uh, the world over. So, um, that's where I stand. All right. Well, let's go to everyone else. And by the time we circle back to bed, she can jump off the fence. Uh, Stu, what, what do you think about that? Um, ben pretty much took all the words out of my mouth. Musically, no. Um, ideologically, they, they're the essence of hardcore, but they are not the sound of hardcore. That's all I so, have so to that's, say. So that's the question I have for, for you and Ben then. Do, do you think that like hardcore has a monopoly on like DIY ethics? Like, I don't really understand that. Um, I don't know. I, I just think with the shows and with Ian's attitude, that's all that I could really think of when it, in regards to that, it's just like, they just have the punk spirit, but they're not playing punk rock. I don't know. Oh, so so Stu Stu's going even harder that they're not even a punk band. band. Yeah, I wouldn't go that far. Oh, I mean, I mean, no, erase that. <laughs> Hardcore band. <laughs> yeah, dude, Dan, I'm not Dan, getting Daniel, into that. Daniel's getting his money's worth. <laughs> Fuck. You know, it's funny. I've been in contact with with Ian Mackay because Minor Threat are going to do a book about minor threat the band the, the five members of minor threat are going to do a book together and i was like i want to write the i want to help you write the book like i wrote a book like i straight up was just like ah, maybe we met a few times like and, and and ian's like yeah i got i think we got it covered <laughs> yeah you maniac <laughs> you absolute maniac ben yeah ben can you feel that question like why do you think that like you're saying they're a hardcore band like in ethics, but do you think that hardcore has a monopoly on, on like that sort of ethics? Like that's, that's the thing that never, that I never understood because like you have plenty of musicians that do it for free or not for the money. Right. Like that's not mutually, that's not exclusive to punk and hardcore. Yeah. And they were, they were like Woody Guth, like, like Woody Guthrie would have been the closest thing in the 40. I mean, like the folk, the folk scene would have been the most like ethically pure, seen happening before you know long before punk was even a thing but like annie defranco or whoever in the you know who that is yeah annie defranco i think she did a lot of stuff where she's like i'm gonna own my own label and then you know right real real diy shit and completely has nothing to do with punk at all so i mean there's there are examples of it outside of punk but like i don't think it's just part of the identity of punk. And I don't know if it's really part of the identity of any other genre, even though there are practitioners of it in other genres. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Yeah. Joe, what do you think? Hardcore band or no? Well, uh, hardcore is punk. So yes. And Daniel. In regards to talking about the, the monopoly on DIY or anything that it's very nuanced, isn't it? Because when you think about it, there's a level of expectation that goes along with a DIY within a hardcore realm. Like you're expected to give respect, show respect to your fellow, you know, people going through the door. There's an expectation of no racism, no bullshit, no, you know, it, it it's it's so nuanced it's extremely hard to put your finger on what it is do you know what i mean but it's known it's a very strange thing that it is known but you can't really describe it <laughs> in bullet point you know and i think um you know talking about the ethos the ethos comes before the sound when 
in this day and age when you think about what is punk and what is hardcore because the sound can be so varied within within those bookends of punk and hardcore and what goes in between it like the sound can really be anything you know, these days it's the ethos and the ethics and the drive and the thoughts behind it that makes it punk and hardcore so you know my stance that's punk is about as hardcore as it gets what about it's, i'm it's saying what like, about fugazi though that's fugazi a hardcore band that's what i'm saying yeah oh okay okay I, i'm saying the the I would say if you were looking at a, you know, an inverted pyramid, you know, the top thing is like sound, you know, and then, you know, motivation, blah, blah, blah. And then down at the very bottom is, is like the thought and the purity of it. And, and that is, you know, what really is hardcore to me. They're a great indie and band. And that's why we've argued. Well, well, you, well so. you, cha- you changed my mind. They're a great indie band. That's that's what it is. Like hardcore has to have a level of of chaos, I think. And but I think there's plenty of chaos in that world. Plenty not, of chaos. What they're bringing to the table by going it, to promoters and telling them, "No, this is five dollars only. Do you want to book us or no?" Like that's chaotic in that world. But if you don't want to, do you let, know what I mean? But if but if you're not letting the people that are listening to the sounds you're making rage. Then I don't. That's I don't. what I was gonna say. Like, like, can you stage dive at a Fugazi show? Why is that part of it? Why is that unnecessary? That's where it gets surface level, I think, because what Daniel's speaking on is very deep. Um, so on the surface, it's like, it's like the chaos, like that, just like that physical chaos. I think you could even get into that, and yeah. then that could no. go into the the sonic chaos too of like having music be fast, but like you're going to go all the way down to like the bones of it. I think that Daniel is 100% right. Well, I, 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 here's the thing, you know, like we've had this funny debate, like over 30 odd episodes of the hundred episodes. (laughs) Right. And, and especially with Greg being on it in the San Diego episodes back in the day, like he'd be like, fuck that. They're telling you, you can't stage dive. That's not punk. That's not hardcore. Fuck that. Right. And, on surface level, like you can think, yeah, who the fuck are they to tell? But there's a deeper reason that they're saying is like, everyone's at this show and you don't know if everyone wants you to jump on their head and certain smaller people or, you know, traditionally people who would stand to the side feel safe going up front and having a different experience at this punk show than they would at other shows, you know? And it is debatable, and that's what's great about this that makes it so punk and hardcore, is the fact that, you know, what what is punk and hardcore to you? And to me, I think the ethos is right up front, and I think for them to say, like, no, we don't want you stage diving during us, is actually and- the same way Straight Edge is punk within punk. You know, it's like, you expect me to be this way, but I'm not. Um, I I don't need that to be this and the same I don't need you know I want equal treatment for everyone here so you know if you want to you know jump off something go to the back of the room and jump off a chair <laughs> you know right they're they're throwing expectations to the wind or they're 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 going up and defying expectation they're like you know, Minor Thread is this punk band. You expect people to get wasted at their shows and whatever. And they're like, all right, we're going to flip the script and be an anti-drug punk band. And then Fugazi is like, all right, we're going to flip the script and, and have this no stage diving rule. And we're not even going to play music that sounds punk. Like, take that. Like, <laughs> There's so much of their music that does sound punk, though. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's I mean, a handful. There are a handful like of if, songs. If we could play "Great Cop," yeah, yeah, right yeah, that's now, one of them. Like, holy shit! Oh, no, yeah, like, the punk ripper. There are about a dozen, this is, maybe maybe a little less songs that are that are punk. It's so funny because it's like <laughs> episode hundred. It's like, all right, let's do a a celebration to Zach. 
You know, and it's like you guys, <laughs> you guys bring out this fucking beautiful birthday cake, and then everyone takes a shit right in the middle of it, and we have to talk about Fugazi <laughs> for twenty minutes. No, this, this, this is this is the recap of a hundred episodes. It is. Bro. It is. <laughs> this is just the beginning. <laughs> but think about it. This is a band that hasn't played a show in twenty-seven years, and we're talking about them still, yeah, because they're. Yeah. Because they did things so differently than anyone else. So did you? Um, oh, seven, sorry, sorry. Seventeen years, not twenty-seven years. All the decades blur together when you get to be our age. <laughs> Gigi Allen was different too. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. For, we could talk about him. Shit. Yeah, so, I, I don't think for, Gigi Allen was punk though. His early shit is really good, <laughs> and I don't mean shit. I mean before he shit. <laughs> The, the pre pre shit shit. Shout out, yeah. Merle, so shout out, so Smelly, good. shout out, Merle's mustache. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Anything else, dudes? Do you? No, want, I just we do, well, do you we know, all just want to say thank you to you. Yeah, putting yeah, so dude. much forward. Well, do, and do you guys getting off your? Daniel, sorry to interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> just that's that's payback. Well, I know you don't like taking. I know you don't like taking compliments, but well, do you do you, um, have, a, do you we, have a favorite episode? Do any of you guys have a favorite episode? I really like the big Bob, big Bob episode because those stories were wild, and I didn't know so much about that because you know I'm not from Oxnard and uh, drink the, the Kool Aid as you guys do, you know, as as you should, you know, I, and I. My two favorite episodes, Big Bob, because I learned so much and the stories were awesome, and Tim from Amenity, because what an intelligent, amazing, clever, passionate person. Yeah, that Tim one was like a a really early good one. And that was one that, that was my first like high pressure episode of inter- interviewing someone that, you know, I knew on a, on a Hey What's Up level, but like don't know him, know him. And also, like, someone that, you know, is, like, kind of like the Tony Cortez of Chula Vista. So, it's like, I wanted, yeah. to, I wanted to do him justice and, like, do all my homework and set him up, you know, set him up for success. Not that he needed any help, but it's like, I didn't want to, like, just be lackadaisical in that interview. Because, like, he's someone that deserves the respect of, like, being put on a pedestal. Um, and the Definitely. big, big Bob one was crazy. I learned a lot too. Like I didn't know that anyone, in a, anyone had a credit card in 1984. Shout out Larry. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like that's wild. <laughs> oh, also the, the Corey episode was really, really great. Yeah. Um, and very emotional when he was talking about Jordan. <clears throat> yeah. That's like, that's been a struggle of the pod. Um, you know, I would like to have more like, ancillary figures like that mentioned. And I, I don't mean ancillary in any sort of negative way. Like what makes hardcore is everyone. Right. So it's like, it okay. seems like all the bands give the glory or, you know, I was able to have Eddie Numbskull on a promoter. Um, I did one episode about roadies, but like, you know, the kids are what make it, you know, and I had Mandel on a Hardsfield on, but like to really represent everyone is hard to do because like, you know, I could interview someone. You don't know if I'm going to get 20 minutes or two hours out of them. So it's just kind of hard to plan things, you know? Um, and I, I really liked that he was able to give good respect to Jeremy and Jordan. Cause like, those are stories that needed to be told and he was the right guy to tell them. Um, and I don't know how you, you bring people up like that otherwise, you know? So that was a really nice part of the Corey interview. And we'll do a part two. Like we just got up through carry on, but you know, his passion project was internal affairs and we'll get into all that. And, and the wild side of Corey and the storytelling will be on the next one. Uh, Joe, did you have a favorite episode? I got to say that, uh, the Hartsfield one is my absolute favorite. Um, cause I just really liked everything he had to say, but the Rob, uh, you know, Rob's two episodes are, are pretty awesome too. Um, because it's it just interests me what he did, uh, you know, uh, 
you know what I'm trying to say. Like, like, like I, I enjoyed those because I wanted to know more about how, you know, his story. So, but back to the ill repeat question from earlier, Jim had the best absolute story on the entire pod so far. <laughs> was, Oh, was that the, the, Tony sixty nine. Tony in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was, oh no, that was John's episode. That was John. That was John. Because John. I have that. I have that's that written down. John. Oh, they said Jim. Yeah, he said Jim. No, I meant John. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I have that written down. Stu. So, Joe, you mustn't have heard that uh, Patreon episode of Rob Moran. <laughs> that? Have you listened to the Patreon episode of of Rob yet? No. Okay. the The Daniels wrestling story is pretty great. You gotta, you gotta hear it. <laughs> it's pretty good. Um, yeah, I, I'm behind on Patreon. Uh, okay. Pod, so. All right. Cool. But yeah, you gotta listen to that one. It's good. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you the timestamp so you don't gotta trod through the whole thing. But no, I'll listen to the whole thing. Okay. Cool. All right, uh, Stu. Do you have a favorite pod? Yeah, the, the In Control one, the Ryan one was my favorite. Just because, like, Aaron's skinhead story was so good and it was just good to see like or hear you dudes also i was actually there for like at least half of that one but it was just cool to like see how you guys like fuck around and have a good time and it just showed that you guys had been friends for a long time and um that's like the meat right there what i look for is just that banter and like shit talking and yeah that's the, that, that was my favorite one but i have yeah. like favorite favorite moments for sure like uh when luke's mic went out um, during the end of the Nard- Nardcore <laughs> Super Seven, yeah, <laughs> he was just gone for the last fifteen minutes. Like, luckily yeah. he got his, luckily he got his final pick in. <laughs> yeah, dude, we have no idea how long is my. He was just not on the phone. That shit was so funny. Um, and then Fred saying the first time he met Ray Crevice was when he got beat up by skinheads. <laughs> that part. <laughs> that, that was the biggest so laugh. Good. That was the biggest laugh. Like that, and then. Daniel's wrestling story, like, but that that way that Fred just like nonchalantly like toss that out. It's like, yeah, first time I met him, got beat up by a bunch of Nazis. You know, it's like just like casually, and then moved on. You know, like it wasn't a big story because Ray's got like several big stories. You know, <laughs> that like yeah. that's just such a funny introduction to the legend of Ray Crevice. You know, <laughs> <laughs> so good. Yeah. And then probably my favorite, which Joe already mentioned, was the Tony Cortez 69 story, but like I've listened to that story, like at least 50 times just because <laughs> you guys, you guys are talking about like driving it with, you guys are talking about pickup trucks and going and touring with that. And then he's like, he, John just stops mid sentences and is like, he's like, Hey, I got a great story. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Hey Joe, had, had you ever heard that story before the podcast? Uh no, I hadn't. That's that's why it's so amazing to me. There's a whole bunch of other stories similar to that, but not that not that one in particular. Yeah, I can't believe that that's like just not a part of Nard lore. You know, <laughs> it is now, dude. Yo, yeah, yeah, that's so funny. Ben, do you have a favorite? Probably the second time Ryan Ryan Fredette was on. Um, there were three of you. Let me t- let me tell you the episode number. That Aaron did. Ex- no, nah, Aaron did the first it, yeah, one. Yeah. Um, no. No, it was um. Here, I'll I'll tell you what pooch one it was. This is this is good radio. Um. Episode thirty nine. Ryan Fredette in control part two. Part. Uh, this is the one uh, with uh, Fernando Hernandez. Oh yeah, Fernando. Us, yeah. Uh, and I was listening to that when I was in New York because I was doing book uh, book signings in, on the East Coast, and it was like I liked it when you were talking about how you you, you brought it up on this episode how you don't want to hate people that you're in the band in a band with, and it made me think of like I went through the same exact thing uh, multiple times with multiple bands <laughs> and I was about to do this. I was about to do this book event and it was like the guy, one of the rappers hated one of the owners of the le- record label and said, if he shows up, I'm leaving. 
And so it was this beef, like that 30 year old beef that I was kind of like in the middle of. And I'm just like, I just want everyone to get along. Like, yeah. like from that, that was the point. Like, it was like a turning point. I'm wearing a turning point shirt. It was like a turning point where, where it was like, <laughs> I just, I just want people to, I don't want to have beef with anyone. Like there are people like, I don't like if I'm in the same room as I just won't, we won't talk to each other. Like, I don't want that to ever happen again. Like the next time I see anyone like that, I'm just going to make the first attempt to go up and just be there, not be their friend, but just be cool with them. Like, like I just, I just want, you know what I mean? Like it was kind of an emotional, like I was, and I was listening to it while being like more stressed out than I've, ever been one of the most stressed out like points in my life which is like exactly a year ago and like yeah anyway that was and it almost sounded like you were you were about to cry zach when you were talking about it <laughs> maybe not <laughs> maybe i mean like i mean to i don't like to pull the curtain back on doing the pod too much but i think that was the same night that we did the robert memorial maybe Possibly. Uh, I think that was because he was okay. on that. Uh, Fernando was on that episode too. Yeah, I think. Uh, like, okay. I, yeah, same. Like it was that we definitely recorded in the same room. Now I rented that motel like I think four times, and I was in like kind of the same room twice. So I I don't know. That was a we- it was a weird night. I think it was that though. But uh, yeah, I mean, like, look, hey, that we put everyone on this pod. And a lot of the listeners, you know, like hardcore and punk is like, you know, it. I don't feel ashamed to say like it is my life. You know what I mean? Like this is what I've lived for like, you know, basically ever since like puberty. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like since as far back as I have like functioning good memories, like I've been into this music. So obviously it's going to bring out some emotion to me once in a while because I lived it and loved it. And like, there's, you know, there's blood, sweat and tears that come along with that, you know? And so that is nice that like, you know, people can connect to, to a podcast, like they connect to a song, you know, like <clears throat> I, I use like the metaphor sometimes, Daniel, this will be a good one. I swear. I won't talk about a marshmallow or a Kung Fu hustle. Um, <laughs> but you know, Dallin like, like <laughs> well, songs, songs can bring back memories like that. Right. Or like, bed you connecting with that pod because like someone's story was like reminding you of like how you are and like you wanted to like change a piece of your life you know like i think that like foods are the same way you know like sometimes you you taste something like a beverage or a food and it's like it brings back a memory of somewhere and music does the same like you know when i did dave hart's podcast he was he was like thinking about tour and like all he would talk about is like you guys played this and you guys played this and it was like you know, like these records that we played for him in the van, you know, I think that a lot of the reason why they stuck with him was because he was listening to them in the van in the middle of the country where he didn't know what was going to happen. You know what I mean? Like this is like the great unknown. You're just like going on tour with Inga Troll who you don't know that well. You know what I mean? It's like these songs are like getting more embedded in him than they might be otherwise. Like if he listened to them in passing. So I yep, don't know. Totally. This that, music, that happens. Yeah. The music is just multidimensional, right? Like you hear a song when you're on a trip and it sticks with you forever. And you hear that song and you think about the trip, you know, or of course yep. it happens with relationships, right? We all have songs that remind us of certain exes and so forth, you know? So that was one of my questions for you that I decided to raise to this stuff that it was stupid, but um, do you remember where you first heard Ignite? Uh, no, I don't honestly, <laughs> you know, I'm sure that Phil Tibbs played them for me. Like I, cool. I would be 99% sure that that would be that. He was pen pals with this kid from Hungary named Yano. <laughs> <laughs> he was confined to a wheelchair, but his mind was strong. Hey, I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah nice the best i actually got a letter from a dude the other day that was like you know i was listening to one of the podcasts in the mail he, no 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 like in the email at 185 uh, miles south of gmail.com um and he was just he wrote a couple of like really really nice paragraphs talking about how 
he loved like when we were talking about how important Ignite was and how important they were to him. And, you know, and it wasn't even like the Brett interview. It was just like one of the episodes when we were talking about it. So it just like, you know, it kind of goes with like the, I know I'm getting preachy about this at this point, but like, you know, what I want to put out in the pod is like the positivity. Like you would Ignite's a band that we could easily flip on and be like, Oh, you know, like whatever that song was stupid or I don't like their later record or, you know, that's weird, but they, they care about the Pelicans, but they're not vegetarian, you know, or whatever the fuck, you know what I mean? Like they're a very easy band to pick holes in, but they were a very important band to a lot of people, myself included. And like, I like that we, we're not trying to like gloss over anything, but like we want to brush on like the positive aspects and uh, that resonates with some people. So. Well, I think that's what's great about the approach because as we look at today's culture within punk and without punk, outside of punk, is you can have a record of 98% like top, tip top behavior and putting people up and, and raising people up and doing all this, but that one misstep that you've had in your past or it currently or a blind spot or something you can like that's the thing that everyone wants to talk about and rip you apart for and and what what is that doing in this world nothing like it it keeps us from fighting the real evils outside the door you know if we're fighting amongst ourselves over bullshit and i think that's you know a testament to um, just the way of thinking, not necessarily just for the pod, just the way of thinking, like, with, you know, put out positivity and get it back, you know? Yeah, I agree. But this is a place where we have a little bit of a platform and also, like, we're we're putting together a group think, right? Like, of an energy we want to put out together. It's not just, like, an energy. No, that's, that's what I'm saying. It's no, I'm like, agreeing, I'm in a, I'm agreeing with you. great concentration. Yeah, I'm agreeing with you. Stop agreeing with me. Nope, I agree with you. I won't go all I won't go all the way in on Fugazi, but uh <laughs> otherwise, yes. So uh to that point I will say we do need more women on the pod, but Yeah. Oh, um, see, like, and and yeah. I know we're trying. I know we're we trying. Do. So of course we do. Well, Kim is great and I want her on all the time. Um all the time. It's just hard to you know, everyone's got different schedules, so you know, and we have a lot of people to cycle through, but I'm trying to get everyone on as much as possible. But you know, it's also it's tough. It's tough to get. You know, you're you're interviewing all these old school, first generation hardcore people, and there just weren't that many women from that playing, being in bands from that generation. Yeah. Um. Um. And and the the first three that come to my mind have all passed away in the last couple of years. The singer of Sin Thirty Four, the singer of Legal Weapon. And Lorna Doom from the Germs. It's like just coincidentally, those are the first three that pop in my head. They all, and they're all deceased. Um, Kira, Kira would be a great Kira. Thing. Kira would be really good. Yeah, but, yeah. There's just not that many. Xine too, but yeah, there's a lot to do. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to. You know, as far as the interview, I mean that that is what it is. But I I just like having Kim's perspective on too. Plus, like. She she bridges a gap of like, I don't know her her entry in hardcore is just like, is kind of like in between me and Stu, right? So she fills that nice like gap of like the, yeah yeah the early two thousands to like late two thousands, you know yeah. the one eight five miles sweet spot <laughs> yeah it's a nice sweet spot and like <laughs> and she was so involved like you know booking shows and so forth she's just a a right. perfect person to have on and like very open musically, you know, like from, you know, seaweed to district nine. So perfect. For so the pod. Perfect for the pod. <laughs> All right. Um, anything else you guys want to brush on before we get out of here? We nailed it. I love you guys. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I don't know if we'll do a hundred more, but we'll try, huh? What I'd like to, to one final thing is just, Hey, everyone out there listening, get in touch. Like, we really want to hear from you and hear your opinions, suggestions, and everything. Like, we we fucking love to know that it's not an echo chamber and that you're, you know, what do you want to hear, you know, going forward? Yeah. That's one thing. 
Yeah, I really, really like doing the Super 7s and the side A and side B. Um, I really, really like yeah, them. So fun. that's like a great thing for people to reach out on. You can let us know what you want us to do the Super 7s on. It's not like limited to, you know, regions. We did like Revelation Records. We could do record labels. We could do genres. Uh, I was talking about maybe doing some years. You know, like it'd be fun to do like 1984. Um, and then side A, side B, like shoot over some records you want us to do. You know, like I love the side A, side B because like, you know, one idea would be doing bands like records one versus the other. But a lot of them are too obvious. There aren't a ton of bands that like put out two great records that like would challenge each other, you know? And so like that's why like I like the side A and side B so much is a little bit more positive of just like talking about the good things about a single record. But uh yeah, right. shoot all that stuff through that you guys want to hear and it is much appreciated. 185 miles south.com. And thank you for the support over the year and a half or whatever it is. And uh we'll keep it going as long as we can. And that's it. Um Yeah. Cool. Later. <laughs>